Professor! 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 It's time for all of Python in 10 minutes. Boop. Hello! Howdy and welcome! If this is our first time meeting, thank you so much for tuning in to Data Leap, where we'll bring the data science world down to earth. We want to help you become a data scientist with very digestible pieces of videos that share how easy it is to break through and beyond. By the end of this video, you'll have taken a crash course in Python that'll get you as far as you need to do data science the right way. Check in the description below if you want to check out this timestamps for each individual Python concept if you want to pick up somewhere in the middle or pick up somewhere all the way at the end and go backwards. This course is not just for people who are interested in data science. Learning a coding language in this day and age is as important as learning to tie your shoes. You could do without, but you won't get very far. This will be Professor Meatball's custom course that has given him stunning reviews such as this was the encapsulation of four years of my undergraduate degree, this was the encapsulation of two years of my master's degree, this was the encapsulation of all of the Python I've ever used in my 30 year work history. Thank you Professor Meatball so, so, so much. I love you. You're such a good boy. That big timer is about to go on, so just before we start, remember that we covered how to install Python and Conda in the last tutorial. Please check it out. We'll have a link right above. And Professor Meatball asked me to ask you guys if you like this video, go ahead and give it a big thumbs up so we get some feedback of exactly what you guys are looking for and how we can continue to help you achieve your goals. And without further ado, let's get started. What I was able to sneak into that intro just then was installing Jupyter Lab, which you'll see the command right up top. I'll make sure that these commands are not only on the top of the video, but also within the description so you can copy and paste. Make sure that you're inside your environment with Conda Activate and jump on in to Jupyter Lab. That's the command that we'll put in to activate our IDE. For me, this opened up in Chrome. This will open up in your default browser. You'll see that we're here at a terminal, just like before, deja vu. Let's build an entirely new sandbox folder. CD into that sandbox folder and go ahead and press this plus sign and start our first notebook. If your notebook doesn't look like this and you want the dark setting, go ahead and go to settings and then Jupyter theme, dark. So your very first notebook, let's title it my first notebook. And we're one minute in, which means it's time for hot secret tips about how to run your notebook smoothly. For a data scientist, efficiency is everything. So you need to remember an easy acronym, enter escape ab da da da. Enter is how you get into a cell to input text. Escape is how you get out of the cell and press either A or B to put a new cell up or below the cell that you're currently in. Finally, DD, press the D key twice to delete the cell that you're currently selecting. You must be outside the cell with escape. Finally, to differentiate between code and not code, we can comment with a hotkey. Make sure you're holding down control and press the forward slash button. It is the same button as the question mark button. And just know that you can also press it again to uncomment. Commented code will not run, which sometimes makes debugging a nightmare, something you can find above in the memento sketch where debugging is living hell. Coming in at two minutes, let's start with types. We have an integer, one and 2.0. That is a floating point number. These are the two types of numerics inside Python. You notice that two point is also a floating point number and math is the same as it is in the math classroom. Just note that every time you divide, you will get a floating point number, no matter what integer will not come out. A quick reminder to use parentheses for order of operations and we move on to assignment. Here we have a variable called a and I'm putting the value 2 into it. Now b is also 2. Adding a and b together returns the values of a plus b which is 4 and we can reassign a's value to 3. Now a plus 
B equals 5. In fact, if we go up to the cell that we ran before, it is also 5. Be really careful when you're assigning and reassigning values of variables. Let's just round out math real quick. We have 2 to the power of 2, which is just asterisk asterisk and we can have the square root of 2 which is 2 asterisk asterisk 1 half the three minute marker means that's time for strings now it's a good time to tell you about protected variables if you try to do str you'll notice that it glows in green anytime this happens python is protecting this variable so do not try to use it for assignment let's have our first string be hello world as appropriate and we'll use the print statement to return it to a console for example if you're running a dot pi file you'll be able to see it out inside your console. And you guys know my catchphrase, strings are just an amalgamation of letters. These are actual lists of individual characters that we can index through. Indexing is synonymous with picking exactly which part of the string you want, starting at what point, stopping at what point, and how, if at all, do you want to step or skip. It's one by default, but you can use two for every other element and so on and so on. Notice that the D is missing. That's because stop does not include that element, which we put as negative one, the last element. Element. The four minute marker means that we now concatenate strings. This means putting two strings together. You'll notice that I can put my name as data leap, make sure to put a comma there, and they output together. This goes back to the catchphrase that strings are just what? Amalgamations of individual characters. You might be asking if I needed a string that had an apostrophe inside, like ancient proud of me pod, that would ruin the string, as you can see from the coloring. You can use double quotes and still use a single quote inside it, or the opposite double quotes inside and single quotes outside. One last string indexing tip, you don't need a start, stop, or step. If you leave out any of the values, they will use the default values, and if you put negative one as the step, it'll reverse the string. Let's see if it works with the palindrome. Race car, race car. If you wanted a line break, as in print on a separate line, backslash n will do it for you, and I still have race car. Cool. For more list-like objects, let's look at a list of mine. This is just three ones in a row, no much of an issue, but what if we wanted to have a set instead? That means no repeats, no hesitations. A set cannot have repeated values, so it condenses all the ones into one. A list can also have different kinds of types inside. You see that we have a string, a integer, and a float. They all fit inside nicely. Now time for dictionaries, which can also hold multiple types of objects. We have key value pairs, which would also be known as an associative array in other languages. Since keys are mapped directly one-to-one -one with values, you'll be able to index into a dictionary similar to a list except with the key instead of the position. This is a lot more family-friendly when it comes to reading other people's code. Now let's talk about logic. We have a couple of logic operators here, equals equals tests equivalency, and we're checking whether one equals one or two equals one. Since the first statement is true, that makes the entire statement true. Now that we know true and false, we can put them into if statements. If the statement is true, then you can run the code that is after the if statement. Here we've indented it so the code knows exactly what to run. But your if statement doesn't have to be true. Let's make an incorrect if statement. Since one does not equal two, we cannot run the code underneath the if statement, but we can run the code underneath the else statement. Equal equals checks for equivalency and bang equal, this is what we call the exclamation mark tests for unequivalency. If the world was just if and else's, that'd be kind of bland. Luckily there is an else if or elif. Put an elif statement in between your first if statement and your else statement, therefore checking multiple conditions. But remember, order matters, so whichever elif statement is first true, that's the one that is going to trigger, and the rest of it is going to be ignored. In this particular elif statement, we're using an operator called in. This checks if an object is within a list. Conversely, you can put not as a similar bang equal sign, opposite meaning of in. This checks if an object is not within a specific list. It's the seven minute mark which means it's time to iterate through our first for loop. A for loop looks inside a list and then for each object in it does something to it. Here we're printing each object. But the objects are still in the list. If you want them out and out permanently, use the dot pop method. Methods are built in Python functions and you'll notice that if we look inside our list again, that particular 1.0 float is now missing. 
but no need for crying over missing variables. All you need to do is dot append a different method and put in exactly what you want to add to the list. It adds to the very back of the list, so it looks like it never changed. Our detour into the dot pop method was covertly a way to introduce the while loop. This loop, unlike the for loop, which iterates through each object in a list, iterates until a specific condition is satisfied. Here we're checking whether or not the list of many types is not empty. Once it is empty, the condition is no longer satisfied, which means the loop has to end. Since we popped every single element, it's empty and barren. Let's put that list back in there because you're not quite done with you yet. Let's copy our while loop and make it a little more interesting. Let's introduce a concept called dot format. Slap this method at the end of any string and it'll replace any open close curly brackets that you have in the string with whatever object you have inside the method. Here we are printing out what item we're currently popping and what the current condition of list of many things looks like. In the home stretch, let's start our very first function. Whatever we just did with that list pop method, we can do that down here with this function that we're defining list popper. It takes in an input list, which we defined up here. I'm just copying and pasting the code we had and changing the input list. Now, when you run this function, it's not gonna do anything. But when you call it with the input list, you'll notice that it's going to come out with the exact same output as we had above. This makes your code reproducible and much easier to read because you're referencing code that you wrote already instead of having to repeat it every time. Let's make a better version of our list popper. This list popper too is an exact copy, but we're going to put an if statement up above in case some rascal wants to put input into the function that is not a list. Note that the entire while statement needs to be underneath the if statement in order for it to run. When the input is a list, it works the exact same as the previous function, but if it's not a list, it's not a list. That's not the only way that Rascos can break your code, so we need to be even more prepared. Let's try a try except block. Your console will not throw an error if anything goes wrong under the try block, instead it'll run the except block. I'm gonna vaguely say that something happened, even though you can tailor make different exceptions depending on the errors that occur. Let's try this bad input on all three iterations of our list popper function. The very first function would just throw the error, while the second function knows it's not the correct input. <laughs> We started with math, now we'll go back to math as one of the possible packages you can import. Truly, the power of Python is within its packages. Now say that three times fast. Fluency with a coding language is just like a spoken language, so now you have the skills to start practicing. If you're a voracious reader, go ahead and read the documentation to learn more about classes, input, output, etc. And know that we ended with Pi, because Python is a piece of cake. Hey, if this was helpful, leave a comment for Professor Meatball so that he can have office hours and take care of those questions for you. Share this, leave a like, and make sure to tell us what to do next. We'll have content like this every week. Something funny and something educational. For now, we'll see you next time. Peace.